looking out onto my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. Listen to them, the children of the night. What music they bring. <laughs> From the DE Studios, welcome to the Dracula Podcast. I am your host, Lawrence Burgess, or LB for short. Thank you to my producer, Adam Stover, Rob, and Martha of Southgate Media, and most of all, you for listening. We aim to bring you thoughtful, stimulating media, reviewing the films, books, music, and plays that make Stoker's creation so beloved, the criticism to inform your purchasing decisions, interesting guests, and the needs of our communities. Please send us your questions and comments. Drop us a line on Facebook at the Dracula Podcast. There you can find the application to play directly into your browser. Stick right in on Facebook, and there you've got it. You can find us everywhere. You can also find us at facebook.com slash Dracula Audio No Spaces. Also Dracula Audio No Spaces on Twitter. That's Dracula Audio No Spaces on Facebook and Twitter. Or email the Dracula inbox at audio.dracula at gmail.com. We will do our best to respond to queries by direct response or on our show. And ladies and gentlemen, I've been talking to you about this for a long time now, but I'm extremely proud to let you know that this podcast is also brought to you by the Foxborough in Charleston, West Virginia. If you've heard Greg Hunt on our previous podcasts, you know what a brilliant mind the man has. They are the industry leader in scoring, multi-track audio recording, mixing, mastering, production, and graphic design. You can find them on Facebook. It's very easy. Get in there, click, give them a like. For queries, please send correspondence to 1007 Bigley Avenue, Suite 319, Charleston, West Virginia, 25302. Once again, that's the Foxborough at 1007 Bigley Avenue, Suite 319. Charleston, West Virginia, 25302. Folks, welcome. I really appreciate you guys for sticking in and joining the sexiest podcast on the internet. And we're only made like that because of you. We hope you took a chance to listen to our previous episodes. If not, don't worry. Check out the Southgate Media homepage at southgatemediagroup.com. That's southgatemediagroup.com. And not only will you find an archive of all our episodes, but you can find us everywhere, folks. We're on iTunes, Libsyn, Stitcher, and a whole mess of other places around the friendly interwebs. The 10-episode second season of Penny Dreadful, hallelujah, premieres two days before Cinco de Mayo on May 3rd at 10 p.m. on Showtime. Once again, that's season two of Penny Dreadful, yes, the awe-inspiring mites of Ava Green, Timothy Dalton, Josh Hartnett, and the rest premiering on the 3rd of May at 10 p.m. on Showtime. No excuse, none whatsoever. We're going to prepare you for the second season as we've been doing so on the Dracula podcast, touching on each episode of Penny Dreadful chronologically. Right now, we are on episode number six, so spoilers ahead. We've also been beating you up to death to buy the Blu-ray of Penny Dreadful on season one. The amount of detail, the special features... And just the overall experience, it's, there's so much value in it. If you find season one of Penny Dreadful on Blu-ray for under 40 bucks, and I just went out to Best Buy today and I saw the thing for under 40 bucks, grab it. Once again, no excuse. If you don't watch it, the terrorists are going to win and no one wants that. Do it for the love of America and do it for the love of great TV. Our ratings are going up and up and up and it's all because of you. We're going to get out in the public. We're going to see you. We've got a lot of special things coming into the show. We're continuing our Hammer Reviews with John Johnson this week. We've already covered three films. We're going to cover more. We're going to go all the way from good to bad, for better or worse. It's coming. Penny Dreadful is a great show. There's no doubt about it. I'm not talking to you just because I'm a fan. We are very very critical on media. And if you've listened to our introductory shows, specifically on Dracula Untold and the NBC version of Dracula and Dracula 3D, you know that we don't promote garbage. And we're going to let you know when it is garbage so you can keep your hands clean and you don't have to smell that stink. But Penny Dreadful is great. The acting is wonderful. They line up their shots. The frames mean something. The words from the script mean something. 
It's an homage to literature in the best way possible. I don't know if you've realized this or not, but the theme of this show is value. Penny Dreadful maximizes your value. Folks are extremely busy. Not everyone can sit down and watch 556 TV shows per week. Folks like you and me are busy. And the best way you can spend your time, if you want to watch a show, is Penny Dreadful. No, it's not for kids. But this is a wonderful piece of television history. And we've been told that this is the golden age of television. And to get something like this that's so good on so many levels consistently, from episode to episode, folks, take advantage of it. Are you ready? Yes, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's news from around the globe. We're going to start off with the Dracula Festival. From the Victorian Vampire Society in the UK, it's the Dracula Festival, the 2nd and 3rd of May this year. In Corvin's Castle, Romania, we'll have a film projection of Dracula, a medieval theater violin concert, archery and sword lessons, medieval fights and tournaments, special guest Dacre Stoker, the premiere of Dracula Meet the King, and a special vampire ball on the 2nd of May. It's in the partnerships with the European Castles Fair. Once again, that's at Corvin's Castle, Romania, 2nd and 3rd of May, 2013. And folks, we also want to let you know about the Bram Stoker Awards Festival. That is in Atlanta, Georgia this year, May 7th through the 10th of 2013. And the centerpiece is the Bram Stoker Award, and it is also the 25th anniversary of the convention. Dacre Stoker will be there for a special presentation. Guests of honor, Cammie Garcia, John Ferris, Christopher Golden, Charlene Harris, Tom Picrilli, and editor guest of honor, Chris Rial. And once again, that's the 7th through the 10th in Atlanta. That's the World Horror Convention. And it's this 25th anniversary showcase with the Bram Stoker Awards. And a good friend of our show, Michael Nost, he's up for yet another Bram Stoker Award in his first novel, The Return of the Mothman. It's a great read, and if you haven't picked that up, go right ahead and do it. That's Michael Nost, Return of the Mothman. It is nominated for a Bram Stoker Award this year. And just a reminder before we head directly into our subcast, please check on your friends and family, folks. The weather is unpredictable. We're not sure where it's going to go. It's been hot and cold here. Just make sure you check on your friends and families and neighbors. All right, folks. Here it is. This is our subcast. Casting Dread, The Penny Dreadful Show. The sixth episode of Penny Dreadful is entitled, What Death Can Join Together. It was written by John Logan and directed by Koki Giedroik. And now it's time for a little story. We open to Vanessa and Sir Malcolm standing in her room, looking at the blood of Fenton and a broken window. She can't stay in such a room. They exchange heated words, yet they have indeed lost their families. Back at the Mariner's Inn, Brona is ill in bed. Ethan returns. Brona wonders where he was. Ethan responds that he went out with Dorian Gray. She apologizes to him. He doesn't mention what happened on the previous occasion. Back at the mansion, Vanessa lays out her tarot cards in a cross formation. The bottom card is the V of Cups, the left the moon, and then she hears the sounds of boats, water, and the screaming of men. She relays to Sir Malcolm her vision, he suggests the Port of London. Dorian arrives, wishing to take Vanessa on an adventure. She accepts. As Victor is in his laboratory preparing for his operations, Caliban is in the basement of the Grand Guignol. Maud, the lovely actress, comes down to have Caliban fix her blood pump. He does so, and she says that he does not have to hide from her, and he is moved beyond words. Vanessa is having her photograph taken. Dorian doesn't like photos, but paintings, as they capture eternity. Vanessa says that some believe that a photo can capture the soul. Dorian will treasure this piece of her soul. Caliban leaves Maud with a gift. While spying on her from behind a wall, another actor comes in and they kiss. 
Caliban is heartbroken. While Dorian invites Vanessa to dinner, Victor is on the street studying the female form of a ballet class. Dr. Van Helsing visits him. Victor asks if fate can dominate a life forever and if sin follows as such. Van Helsing wants to hear his story. Victor promises that he shall tell him someday. Vanessa is ready for her date with Dorian, so Malcolm tells her that she is beautiful. She wants to know why he pours over documents. He tells her that it is related to an expedition. Yet when she leaves, he closes the documents and he and Zimbeni get ready. Zimbeni wants to know what Sir Malcolm will do when he finds Mina. Sir Malcolm will save her. Zimbeni disagrees. They are two different people. They must do what is necessary. Ethan is at the inn. Bruno wants Ethan to be careful because he will get sick. But he tells her he has all confidence that she will take care of him. Before he leaves, he kisses her on the forehead. On the London streets, Ethan meets with Sembeni and Sir Malcolm. They have some distance to walk, as they are to explore a plague ship. Van Helsing tells Victor that he cannot relay the truth to Sir Malcolm because it would be unbearable. Van Helsing says that his wife did not succumb to disease or normal death, but that he himself drove a stake through her heart and cut off her head. On the walk, Ethan is brooding and Sir Malcolm queries. Brona is not well. Though Sir Malcolm offers to pay for a private asylum, Ethan wants to stay at home. The ship they seek came from Cairo and was soon after quarantined. Due to the tattoos on the corpse and the ship's arrival, it is suggestive of chicanery. Vanessa and Dorian are at dinner. As he serves her, they discuss their history. She has a complicated past with the Almighty, and he left equally happy and unhappy by his past experiences with various cultures. As Sir Malcolm, Ethan, and Sembeni finally find the ship, Van Helsing speaks with Victor. There are such things as creatures who exceed the boundaries of life and death. Those who feed on the blood of the living. They move in a pack like wolves and then vanish, taking the best beloved with them. For the dead travel fast. At the mansion, Vanessa is taken in by the many paintings. She walks and admires. Then Dorian touches and seduces her. Aboard the ship, Zembeni, Sir Malcolm, and Ethan look over the still female bodies. They are pale-faced and still. None of them are Mina, yet underneath the surface lies the master, asleep. Van Helsing walks the streets with Victor, wishing him a long life. Van Helsing knows his life is at an end, but he thinks of Victor as a son. Suddenly, Caliban rushes from the shadows and takes Van Helsing in an alley. Then Caliban grabs him, looks at Victor, and snaps Van Helsing's neck. Victor lies on the ground, holding Van Helsing's dead body as Caliban warns him not to temporize. Victor weeps. Caliban warns against it, as he has also learned that skill. He will kill all at Victor's side. On the ship, the pale-faced beings awaken. Simbeni, Ethan, and Sir Malcolm are quickly surrounded and overrun. It is only through great force and resistance that they gain even a small advantage. A fire starts and they disperse. The Master rises. Sir Malcolm looks into the Master's face as the Master grabs someone from the shadows. It is Mina. Sir Malcolm screams, but the fire goes ablaze and they cannot follow. He has lost her again. Vanessa and Dorian are in the bedroom, mounting each other. Mm. Then Vanessa takes a blade and cuts at Dorian's skin. She laps up the blood as they continue. Then a voice speaks to her. It has been waiting for her. And what games they shall play. Then quickly, Vanessa leaves. Back at Sir Malcolm, Ethan warns Sir Malcolm that there are things that cannot be controlled. Despite the pain, there are some battles that they lose. A scarred Dorian walks to the secret door and stops at a large object. He removes the cover from it and gazes up. His wounds heal. Then Vanessa returns home, her face worn. Sir Malcolm gapes in awe as Vanessa levitates from the ground and begins to spin. 
more questions. It is evident that Vanessa is being led to the master, yet Sir Malcolm now seems protective. Why this change? Why this kindness? Dorian can heal himself from injury. He has lived many years. How long has he truly lived? No one is safe around Victor with Caliban watching. The creature will not stop until Victor is at his work. Who is next to die? And Vanessa has been overcome by the darkness. How far will her possession go? These are all questions we have to answer next time. Ladies and gentlemen, we've hoped you enjoyed our bit of storytelling. That is episode 6 of Penny Dreadful, What Death Can Join Together. Simbeni is given more to do in this episode for the benefit of everyone. It's hinted in the dialogue that there's a long history between Sir Malcolm and Simbeni, and they're almost family. But it's almost too late to introduce him. It's like the writers are catching up. Despite the complexities of the story episodes 1 through 5, there was room for him to have more to do earlier. It's now episode 6, we're starting to learn about him, and it feels a little bit too late. Proteus, Fenton, Van Helsing, not one character on this show is safe. The methodology behind killing Van Helsing is that the writers are forging their own path from Bram Stoker. It's understood, but the relationship between Van Helsing and Victor really wasn't given enough time to grow and give that impact, but yet it's a short season. I'm not sure why Dorian fits into the story and his real purpose besides being a sexual interest for the characters. There's a theme of immortality and it's apparent that it's continuing, but it's not clear. At this point it seems to be a mystery without cause, unlike Vanessa and her possession, but I'm certain as the episodes progress that mystery will be unraveled. Despite these very tiny flaws, the rest is positive. The characters are all going through hell and it's only getting worse. Sir Malcolm has a glimpse of Mina only to have her taken away again. It's a gorgeous use of color and the framing is wonderful. Performances are solid, especially the characters of Ethan and Simbeni. They both stand out in this episode. Good directing, solid script, perfect pace. And now Vanessa has been taken over. And it's about to go down. All right, folks, we're back at the Dracula podcast. We hope you enjoyed our subcast, Casting Dread, the Penny Dreadful Show. That's six down and two more to go. And right now we're getting into the media review portion of our show, or as Professor Van Helsing calls it, The ghastly paraphernalia of our beneficial trade. Every word the man speaks is powerful. Speaking of the man himself, we have John Johnson back once again. We've been covering the films of the Hammer Horror series. We've covered The Horror of Dracula, Brides of Dracula, and Dracula Prince of Darkness, all solid films. So as we continue, what films are going to get the seal of approval, and which ones should you avoid? We're going to get into that right now. In 1968, Terrence Fisher left, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. He also did some other great work of Hammer, like The Devil Rides Out, and my favorite Hammer film of all time, Curse of the Werewolf of Oliver Reed. Oh, yes. But... Freddie Francis took on Dracula Has Risen from the Grave, and it was written by Anthony Hines. Jimmy Sangster had also moved on. Mm -hmm. Set this up for us. Well, in the end of uh, Dracula, the Prince of Darkness, of course, I don't want to reveal too much, but ice is involved. Mm -hmm. So you have this, um, you know, the body of the Count interred in a sarcophagus of ice that over years has come down the face of a mountain. And you just happen to have a priest that was going up to Castle Dracula to exercise it, and uh, a little bit of blood is involved there, and Dracula is resurrected. An interesting way of doing it, but um, very fascinating in how they came up with that one. You ha actually have Dracula using the priest as a, a consort, basically, you know, and or a, a henchman. And he had the tendency to do that. Yeah, yes, he did. Yes, he did. But this, I think, is the film where it really, really start. They really started bringing in um, the spiritual, more so than what they had in the previous ones. It was an evolution in that respect. And also, they were stuff. testing the sensors. Yes, they were. <laughs> yes, there was quite a bit of that in Hammer films, um, especially the later on in the '60s. It went, but the storyline overall, I thought, was very interesting. The movie um, does seem to come short on a few things. 
even though the story is interesting, there are a few things that I wish they would have elaborated on a little more. I think the story itself, um, it could have used a better protagonist. Honestly. Oh, I agree. Absolutely. Christopher Lee, Christopher Lee, of course, has that dominating screen presence. But when you've seen it before, you need something else to build onto that. Of course, he's now speaking. Correct. There, the art direction is okay. The cinematography is okay. Mm -hmm. But there's something missing. The, the death scene, of course, is memorable. But yes. all the things involving Christopher Lee, you could call as memorable because you're... You're capturing a moment in mm -hmm. history. So, unfortunately, I can't give this the Dracula podcast seal of approval, but I also can't consider it garbage either. I consider it that borderline piece. Yeah, yeah. But as for consuming Prince of Darkness, going back one, you can buy it on Blu-ray. It's a solid watch. Great documentary attached to it. Uh, Dracula has risen from the grave. You can probably watch that once. I wouldn't necessarily pay money to watch it, but if you do, don't spend more than six or seven bucks. Exactly, yes. So, two years later, we have the same screenwriter, Anthony Hines, but a new director, Peter Sazdy. If you'll notice, the directors begin to change, and that often spells doom for franchises. True. Taste the Blood of Dracula. Ah, Tell yes. us about that one. Pushing the censors a bit more, you know, a lot, a lot more uh, satanic type things coming into the storyline. Uh, Dracula once again is resurrected um, to wreak havoc on things. The one thing that stands out on this story, by this time it's becoming routine. I feel like Christopher Lee is putting out a canned performance. Dracula's Risen from the Grave and Taste of Blood of Dracula to me are very... Too, too similar in the way they were set up, and I, I didn't feel the creativeness of the earlier pieces. But the music is just beautiful. I, I loved the musical suite to Taste the Blood of Dracula. I believe it's Bernard Herrmann. I believe you're right. He, he did from Horror of Dracula, and then I believe he stayed on mm -hmm. at least through that movie. Of course, there's one thing, too, that's missing uh, in several of these films that we've spoken of so far that, that I feel is a requirement. With I'll bet it's a I bet it's a person whose initials are PC. It is. It is. Well, it's the character of Van Helsing, um, I, that strong character to take on Dracula. If they would have brought Van Helsing in, especially in uh, Risen from the Grave and Taste the Blood of Dracula, mm -hmm. I think if they would have brought Van Helsing in, it would have been a better. They would have been both better movies. Yeah, I agree. However, I actually like Taste the Blood of Dracula better than Risen from the Grave because they pushed that pseudo satanic ritual but it wasn't over too much there was an abusive relationship between yes. parent and child dracula in a way is almost could be considered a little bit of a savior in a way of this girl what's worse a life with dracula where she enjoys the pleasures of the world or being uh, oppressed by her father figure that's true that's true i thought it lagged at times I thought I also agree with you that the resurrection sequences are becoming formula, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, you can't do that with movies. I think at this point they're trying to make money rather than telling a good story, right. so they kept the risk factor low. Right. Uh, once again, it's on the borderline of the seal of approval. I can't give it a negative. Well, another thing too to consider is the fact that consistency is starting to lag in the storyline. They don't these these two movies don't really follow within the line. I mean, you have that aspect in the beginning of Dracula Has Risen from the Grave that it does tie in with Prince of Darkness. But when you go along, by, by the time Taste of the Blood Dracula comes in, the story that we're told in the beginning does not match up with what we've seen in the series. Continuity is a big thing. In, and, and it also lacked it in their Frankenstein series with Cushing. It is. Uh, I cannot give it the Dracula podcast seal of approval, but I can't consider it garbage either. So it's one of those movies which I like better than Risen from the Grave, but I would also say don't spend more than six or seven bucks to grab it on DVD. Mm -hmm. You can probably get it in a package, and I believe you can. The Warner Home Video offers that with a package mm -hmm. with Risen from the Grave and Horror of Dracula. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was our media review portion of the program. We've continued on with the Hammer Horror series reviewed by Dracula historian and aficionado John Johnson whose sublime performance as Abraham Van Helsing in Dracula the audio drama, as well as his portrayal of Mr. Swales, 
It's already sending shockwaves throughout the media. I can't wait for you guys to see it. Not only is his background in theater, but he also plays Santa Claus every single year. And I believe his first year was 1985 or 1983. And if you're around the St. Albans area, go see Santa Claus. John's amazing and uh, I'm more proud to call him a friend. Folks, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much to my producer, Adam Stover, Rob and Martha of Southgate Media, and most of all, all of you for listening. We're going to continue on with Penny Dreadful. We've got two episodes left to go before you're ready for season two. And we're also continuing with our Hammer Horror reviews. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, to you and yours, have an excellent day.